All right, everybody, we're going to get started here. If anybody has any questions, feel free to use uh, the Q&A. Uh, we've got someone monitoring that, so we'll try to loop uh, around any questions that you guys ask. Um, if uh, at any point you guys can't hear me or anything like that, uh, just hit them up and they'll, they'll flag us that we've got a problem. So I'd like to thank everybody from uh, hopping on today. Uh, we're going to be talking about some IT security related to all the fun that's going on with the coronavirus. So, a slide I like to misuse constantly here uh, that 95% of uh, failures are going to be the customer's fault. What's really interesting about that is that's before everybody started uh, becoming a remote workforce, and that's before everybody got distracted with everything going on with the pandemic and the new clickbait attacks. Uh, and so it'd be interesting to know if that 95% is going to go to 99 or if they can go over 100 or something interesting like that. Um, but it's something that we all have to be concerned with. So two key things that are in the news. Uh, so there's an old banking Trojan that's nice and in the wild now. Uh, basically, it's all about RDP brute force attacks. Uh, one of the reasons this is coming back up uh, is because of the remote workforce and you know the desire to disperse everybody out of the buildings and get them working remotely. Uh, folks are just dropping RDP uh, online or in weak VPNs. Uh, so, you know, naturally the bad guys are noticing that and are really escalating uh, an RDP brute force attack. Um, you know, one of the important things to say here is this is a good example of something that instantly goes away with two-factor authentication or MFA. Uh, so you'll probably hear us uh, repeating that a lot because most of the issues uh, related to hackers right now uh, can be circumvented with standard security and multi-factor. Uh, another piece here is uh, data scraping and account takeover attacks. Uh, right now it's in e-retailers. They're usually the first, um, but then everybody else is short to follow. Uh, so we see this as a, another sign that account takeover is going to be really huge during this work from home uh, time period. All right, so let's talk about some escalating threats. Uh, so one that we brought up uh, last week, and we're going to bring it up again, is fake uh, virus maps. Uh, we ourselves got maybe four or five different calls from people who uh, had employee systems blocked off the network because they were hitting uh, these fake uh, coronavirus maps. Uh, so we thought that um, you know, this would be a rare thing, uh, but what it's finding is it's not very rare. People are basically clicking anything related to corona. Uh, and that's now getting worse with a lot of fake news uh, clickbait attacks, or better yet, social media, quote unquote, alerts. Uh, and, and this is where people are seeing things like, oh, businesses are going to get shut down. Uh, the governor is going to mandate everybody work from home and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and what happens there is just everybody is clicking it. Uh, no matter how many times we tell them not to, and if they're working from home, it's even worse because uh, they're in the comfort of their house where they're used to clicking on random social media things. Uh, versus being at work where they've been taught to think twice before clicking things. Uh, and so what we see here is that that's really going to be escalating uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and the more the government crimps down what people are allowed to do, how they're allowed to leave the house, uh, we see that this is just going to keep logarithmically going up. Uh, and so we have to do something to protect ourselves from it. Uh, and it's going to have to go beyond our traditional don't click things, uh, you know, don't click random news articles, because uh, there seems to be no, no stopping anyone from that uh, at the moment. Another escalated threat is as we're throwing people uh, remotely, uh, something that's interesting is behavioral analytics. A lot of security systems are based on behavioral analytics, which is based on what is normal. Uh, and if anyone here has sent people to go work from home, you've changed what normal is. Um, as a result, your security is going to take a natural hit uh, as the systems have to relearn what is normal, what is standard, uh, what is a okay and a non-okay behavior. Uh, and, and that really goes with multi-factor. You know, we're seeing that uh, in order to kind of make the mandate of having people not be in the office, 
uh, we're throwing things out the window, such as multi-factor. So when we mix a lack of multi-factor, the fact that behavioral analytics needs to relearn what behaviors are, and then these uh, clickbait attacks, uh, you, you really have a combined uh, mess of you know, what people could fall victim to. Uh, along with that, uh, you know, typically to have all the remote access work well, we do what's called split tunneling, uh, and that's gonna make that follow me style security even more important. You know, now that everybody's remote, if they're going to be clicking on those clickbait ads or social media alerts or doing Google searches for uh, coronavirus, you know, we gotta make sure that those endpoints uh, that are going directly out to the internet have something in the way that are blocking all of these new spin-up sites that you know are, are less than a couple of days old, for example. Uh, so things like OpenDNS can do that to where it's in that new domain. Should it really be hit? Uh, you know, we don't know if it's trustworthy or not, but we know it got spun up about an hour ago. You know, those are good signs that that site shouldn't be hit anyway. Uh, so getting some kind of follow me security. Um, uh, is another, uh, in addition to two-factor authentication, uh, follow me security is a really good way to help prevent uh, some of the issues that uh, I was just hitting. Um, the next two that become really uh, dangerous are uh, the increased prevalence of the ACH wire transfer fraud uh, and account takeover attacks. Uh, so we know that these two attacks are going up. We know that they are based on uh, malware, we know they're based on phishing attacks, we know they're based on accidentally clicking things, uh, and we're about to end up with a distributed workforce uh, who's used to be able to go down the hall and say, hey, did you ask for this transfer? Or, uh, you know, know that people are working or are not working and are readily available. Well, now that everyone's distributed, uh, we kind of lose that uh, contextual uh, information of what's going on within the company uh, and that can really weaken what our processes are for ACH and wire transfer fraud, uh, especially. Um, in some statistics that uh, I was looking at over the last week, uh, we found that uh, a lot of the ACH wire transfer fraud is uh, continuing to be cycled down uh, to people in the 10 to 200 uh, user counts. Uh, just because the likelihood of having really good security controls uh, is low. Uh, and so it's very easy to steal a little bit of money at that point. And, you know, as with any criminal organization, the ease of uh, theft is really what's going to make them continue to go down until you get to the, you know, three, four, five person companies. Uh, so it's definitely not an issue for only large companies or only banks. Uh, it's actually a problem for every industry, for every size, uh, and it's uh, getting worse quickly. So how do we combat some of these escalated threats? So for the compromised ad banners, the infection maps, things like that, you're going to need a combination. Uh, you're going to need things like SSL decryption, open DNS, next gen antivirus, uh, cloud app security. Uh, you know, those in combination end up being your, your best defense for this style of attack because uh, you are in a distributed world. Um, one of the things that we like about something such as cloud app security is it also helps with the fact that uh, everyone is working from home. They may or may not be on a work computer. They may be on a tablet. Uh, we've had calls from uh, some folks who are rapidly just trying to figure out any box they can put people on to work from home because uh, they were not equipped to send everybody home. Uh, so things like cloud app security can help with that. They can also help with that uh, behavioral analytics piece that we were talking about in terms of changing what is normal uh, and what people are allowed to hit. On the human error side, you, you'll see that uh, in almost every one of these areas, uh, I'll pick on things like open DNS, I'll pick on uh, multi-factor, because they can really do something about every one of these different areas. Uh, most ACH wire transfer frauds we deal with and account takeovers we deal with, uh, of course, MFA would have stopped that. Uh, most of the uh, phishing attacks that we are, are uh, dealing with over here or the drive-by malwares would have been fixed with uh, OpenDNS as an example. Um, we haven't seen a huge push of new executable style malwares with the exception of the infection maps. Uh, and that's really where the next-gen AB is going to come into play. 
Uh, so, you know, a lot of these are uh, non-resident, uh, non-physical file uh, attacks uh, to where just looking at the map uh, will start running a process versus having to click it. Um, although there are some lower tech ones where uh, it is requesting people to literally click on a map for up-to-date alerts all the time, and people are assuredly clicking that button, even though it's you know, we've been training them as the most dangerous thing for them to do, uh, but it's happening more and more that we can uh, track through all the people we uh, work with. Um, on the human error side, uh, two things that we really want to revalidate, especially on the ACH wire transfer fraud, uh, this is a really good time for IT to go remind the business to validate those business processes. You know, what are the callbacks supposed to be? What's the process? What's the process when no one is sitting next to each other anymore? Uh, ACH wire transfer fraud is about people stealing your money and also about people using you to steal other people's money. So you got to really make sure that there's some business processes that are going in all directions for that. Uh, and then the next one here, we've already gotten a, a couple of calls uh, on this uh, since I posted it last week, and that's kids delete files. Uh, we're already getting the calls of, oh, I was working from home, I just stood up for a minute, next thing I know, my kid was at my computer uh, and either was clicking things or deleting files or, you know, just playing with the mouse and accidentally move stuff. Uh, so this is something that we've got to go push to the user community as they start working from home of, they've got to treat it like work um, because now that everybody's there for almost all day, we really have to worry about things like, is that area secure? Is it safe to be working from home? You know, accidents can and will definitely happen, and, and we're seeing it more and more right now. Um, in red, what I have here is sometimes uh, I, I've heard people say, well, if I tunnel all the traffic from all the VPN users, uh, then some of these security concerns go away. The issue with that is a lot of people are expanding uh, how many people are concurrently coming into their environment, uh, sometimes as much as 80%. Uh, percent. Uh, so going from 20% uh, of their staff usually being VPNed in uh, to adding it to be uh, you know, 80, 90% of their staff is now VPNing in. Uh, and so one thing we want to warn against is with the way uh, VPN traffic works, if you do try to do a tunnel all and you're adding a massive amount of concurrent users, you're probably just going to DOS your line uh, and take out your remote access for everybody. Uh, that's typically what we're seeing because tunnel all is not realistic nowadays. Uh, and if you really are having a good chunk of the uh, staff work from home consistently, it, it's not really a supportable uh, way to be. So last week, I had a couple of work from home uh, concerns that I tried to predict. Uh, so one is, do employees know how? Uh, is IT ready? And is anybody actually doing work when they're at home? So our top three calls really basically says those first two predictions were right. Uh, and I'm going to go with the third prediction people just haven't gotten to yet. Uh, and what I mean by that is there's such a high load of calls of just getting people ready that no one has really started about uh, worrying about whether people are actually working from home or not. So some top three things that we've seen over the last week are uh, overload support calls because users can't remember uh, how to get in. Uh, you know, so one of the things that we want to remind people of is go grab a hotspot, have your IT guys test with people before they come in uh, and, and make sure they're actually ready to go and the user remembers how. Uh, we are getting a ton of overload uh, support calls from our clients who uh, you know, are just being overrun and we're trying to, to help them out as well. Um, and you would expect that uh, this is very simple, normal stuff, but for people who don't do it every day, it's not. Uh, and so you might want to think about having new screenshot documentation that you can send out there. Uh, maybe the last time you trained people, you had some different settings. Uh, on your VPN appliances and they need a little uh, cheat sheet or something like that. Uh, but those are things that we recommend. Uh, next bullet here is one I absolutely stole from uh, one of our clients that's actually on the phone right now. Uh, and that is to set up a conference bridge on a specific hour every day and facilitate support. Uh, so how we interpret that is kind of the idea that says if everybody who's working remote knows that you've got a conference bridge open, uh, 10 o'clock every morning, they should just call in. Um, that would be a really great way for IT to help the business, 
uh, and to make sure that people are working and being useful, uh, but then also to compile a bunch of support requests um, at a time. Uh, so that was, a, like I said, a, a client idea that we really like, and we're starting to use it internally as well uh, to kind of bypass the traditional ticket systems and let people know there is definitely a time when you can help them. Next top call we have is licenses for VPN or multi-factor or RSA tokens. So as an example, uh, we've seen situations where RSA, I'll pick on them, uh, it was taking even five days for them to get pricing out. And right now, hard tokens are back ordered. Uh, shockingly enough, it turns out that hard tokens that are made in China are really hard to get shipped quickly right now. Uh, so you really got to think about things uh, such as, do you have the MFA tokens? Do you have alternatives? Can you do soft tokens? Uh, if your su device supports OTP, go that way. Uh, but definitely you don't want to wait. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is fake online sellers or people who claim to be a reseller who turn around a quote at very good low margin pricing very quickly, uh, but often actually getting the license or getting the tokens is a whole different uh, uh, thing entirely. Uh, you know, they're turning around a quote quickly, but they have no better way to actually send uh, the hardware uh, or the license keys from distribution than anybody else has. Uh, so we see this every time there's some kind of pandemic. Uh, you know, we saw this during the H1N1 uh, and, and various others. Uh, it happens every time there's an issue like this. So you should definitely be wary of that. Um, and sometimes uh, even uh, us as an IT uh, company, you know, we get it all the time too. I've gotten probably half a dozen quote unquote new distributors that are ready to get orders out while everyone else uh, who's traditional is bogged down. They're fake. They don't really exist. Uh, and, and the likelihood of you getting the product at all is relatively low. And the next thing we get is people who just don't have a VPN solution that is either uh, built for more than few critical staff or able to scale to take care of, quote unquote, everybody. Uh, so one idea that we uh, wanted to remind people of is a lot of SSL VPN appliances can now be virtualized, which means you can uh, simply uh, spin up virtual uh, remote access systems. Uh, good ones, uh, they are going to have built-in MFA, so that's kind of nice because it goes hand in hand. Uh, I know there's always some uh, feelings people have about MFA and is one MFA provider better than another and are hard tokens better than text messages. Uh, and, and I would push that right now if we're talking about threat management, uh, threats are going after the simplest, easiest targets. Uh, so you're better off going with any kind of multi-factor that you can get versus trying to make sure that you have the utmost and best multi-factor authentication. Uh, your goal is to become a hard target so that uh, the uh, hackers, uh, malware providers, what have you, uh, just shift on to somebody else uh, as opposed to trying to get the greatest system um, that was ever created. So working from home, uh, some how-to tips. Uh, one of the things that we recommend is at any point, if you can convert people to more of an SSL VPN portal, uh, that's where you log into a web page, you get access to things like RDP, Telnet, SSH, file shares, email, things like that, without becoming a node on the network, uh, it's always going to reduce your risk. It's going to reduce the risk of uh, whether it's a uh, domain machine you have control over or if it's a uh, BYOD or home machine that you don't have control over. Uh, the nature of how those work is going to reduce the risk, but it's also going to save you bandwidth. Uh, and the more and more people that are jumping on to VPN, the more important bandwidth is going to be to everyone. Another thing that we've thought of uh, uh, to help some people out was uh, you could always look at spinning up in, for example, Azure or AWS infrastructure as a service, doesn't really matter who, uh, you can actually spin up uh, RDS systems with an SSL VPN uh, virtualized in there and full bore uh, multi-factor or one-time passwords. And that can give you a very contained destructible bubble uh, that you can use to get people in uh, to get them then safely into your environment. 
uh, and to really scale out uh, how many users can hit consistently and what will it look like uh, and not necessarily get bogged down with, do you have hardware, do you need to buy servers and things like that. Um, so not really saying migrate your servers or anything nonsensical like that into the cloud, but more that you can basically make remote access helpers and use infrastructure as a service as a facilitator uh, of that very quickly. Uh, the other good thing about doing it virtually is you don't have to have people come into the office to go implement a bunch of stuff. You can basically do everything remotely at that point. Uh, another risk area is that uncontrolled people, devices, applications. Uh, this is where cloud app security and open DNS is really going to help because that's about securing direct cloud access. Uh, direct cloud access meaning people getting straight to your SaaS apps from their homes uh, and they might be on your boxes or they might not. You might have given them a perfect uh, laptop to take home that they asked for with a tiny screen that's portable and light and all the things they wanted for travel, but now you're telling them to go home and work for three weeks, four weeks, who knows how long, and they're sitting there saying, well, my computer at home has this giant screen and I can work better, so why don't I just use that? Mm -hmm. uh, those are the kind of thinking that um, you have to have uh, to make sure you've got a way to accommodate them. Uh, and you have a way to uh, make that safe. Another important piece about SSL VPNs is uh, if you have applications that can only work from uh, the office, uh, a lot of SSL VPNs have a, a functions that will let you emulate that. It'll let you emulate that with multi-factor authentication, uh, and it'll do it without telling someone, just leave your box on RDP to your desktop at your office and then loop back out. That's a very inefficient and kludgy way to go. Uh, and we've already gotten a couple of calls from customers saying, I accidentally turned off my desktop. What do I do now? Because I can't RDP to it because it's off and there's no one at the office. And so you want to avoid those logistical nightmares. Uh, and so SSL VPNs, they can actually facilitate that. Um, at times, it'll also facilitate if uh, we've got any finance folks or people who need to have a USB uh, key uh, or a cert key that uh, needs to flow through for any banking apps, things like that. That can much easier be helped with uh, an SSL uh, VPN basically running in reverse uh, than it can with trying to map those USB keys across an RDS session or into a VDI session uh, and then bouncing back and forth like that. Um, another piece that's come up a lot is remote desktop. Uh, we, I, I'm bringing it up because we hear a ton of people saying, this is how I'm going to try to facilitate this. Uh, there's a nice link from Microsoft about ways to lessen the bandwidth, uh, but at the end of the day, you've got to uh, kill a whole lot of different uh, uh, prettiness-making configurations. So for example, you've got to get rid of drive mapping and printer mapping, uh, pretty screens, uh, cut and paste functions. All of those, even when they're not in use, take bandwidth. So just having them on increases the bandwidth requirements. Uh, color resolution, screen resolution, another huge one. Uh, one dangerous thing we have nowadays is the newer RDP, uh, as an example, uh, will do a, a test for the connection quality. And everyone at home is on a Fios or a Comcast and what have you. Uh, so if it flags it as a high quality, which is going to be most uh, broadband connections, uh, it's going to default to over 10 megabits per second per user per session, uh, and that's assuming they only have one screen. Uh, that's an enormous amount of bandwidth um, that's really non-functional um, in, in terms of being able to sustain it. And then even if it does low, uh, you're probably talking more about that two megabits per second uh, per user. Uh, and once again, you know, you're talking about sustained rate traffic. Most internet is in uh, bursts. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at it in terms of a graph, it's slamming up and down as people are hitting websites and uh, you have a lot of stateless communication. Uh, RDP is going to be taking that bandwidth at a sustained rate. Uh, so your internet is going to be much less effective and useful as you might expect, even if the math does academically work out. Uh, it typically doesn't work out in practice. And so your goal is to get that down as much as possible. Uh, depending on what you have, 
uh, it may or may not be possible. And what I mean by that is depending on what the security system is will uh, dictate how easy or hard it is for you to control these settings. Uh, if you've got an SSL VPN, it's quite easy to control those settings going to individual desktops. Uh, if you don't, then you need some kind of RDS proxy uh, or VDI proxy or, or something sitting in the middle where you can do centralized control over that. Because a lot of these settings can only be set either A, at the endpoint, uh, or B, as an override on the local system. And if they're RDPing to distributed systems, um, there's not a great way to control that. Uh, and if people are on uncontrolled uh, systems, uh, or uncontrolled uh, work from home uh, BYOD boxes, uh, you know, you can't reach out and change those settings on the far end, which also makes it quite difficult. Uh, another piece to think about, right now, everybody's just worried about getting working. Uh, but then you're gonna have folks who wanna make a big deal about how you got people working. So make sure as you're doing the work from home that you're restricting local copy as well as local printing so that you aren't out of compliance, you haven't broken your contracts, and you aren't opening yourself up to getting sued later, potentially by customers who don't have the money, they're looking for an excuse not to pay you, uh, and so you don't want to make sure that you open that door to them. Uh, you know, realistically, if people are working from home, there's not a good reason for them to be doing local copies of your data. There's not a good reason for them to be printing uh, at home. Uh, so you really want to make sure that you uh, do something about that uh, and that you are uh, thinking about compliance um, because at you know, some point, someone else will be thinking about compliance uh, and they're not going to be real friendly about it, uh, especially if, uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks, things start to settle down. Um, you know, they're going to be hunting for people that broke compliance and can be used as an excuse. All right, so when working from home, you know, you know, we have a lot more cloud and SaaS apps, and working from home really exasperates those issues. So on the left, we have some old thinking here where um, as IT folks and security folks, we had full control over everything. We had perfect control over all the systems, logs, um, you know, the perimeter gateway was in charge. Uh, there was no issues. If anybody wanted anything, they had to come through our gates. We controlled all the gates, easy. With this distribution, we've got to really think about people are coming from businesses, they're coming from home, they're coming from random mobile devices, and they're hitting stuff on the internet, whether it be the Salesforce or 365 or Box. I don't know about you guys, but I've gotten about four emails today uh, from Box saying, hey, we'll give you free accounts to help your work from home uh, be more efficient. Uh, just click this link in and we'll give you some free accounts for the next 30 days. Uh, so that probably means everybody's getting it and people are going to click those uh, buttons. You know, they're going to say, oh, great, this could be more effective. I'm not used to working from home anyway, so I don't really know what the right thing to do is. This looks simple and easy. Let me take that path of least resistance. Uh, so as a result, we really have to think about how are we dealing with those distributed accesses and therefore the distributed threats uh, that go with them. So what we want to consider here is some planning recommendations for working from home. So we get a lot of questions about the firewall. Is the firewall big enough? Can the firewall handle it? And yes, there is a concern that as you pump more through it, uh, it was it sized right for the security services. Um, you know, it, that's a very simple mathematical question to figure out. However, what isn't quite as simple is the VPN connections, what's the load going to be? Uh, and if people have a traditional node on the network, um, uh, which is where someone is going to use a VPN client and have an IP address and be a, a, a node as if they were working internally so that they can, quote unquote, do anything or everything, as they like to say, um, there's no good way to figure out how much bandwidth that's going to take. Uh, especially if you end up having one of your data analysts working from home and they decide to you know, run SQL queries against the backend database, you know, they could easily take out a three, 400 uh, meg line there. You know, or if you have uh, PSTs that are on file shares, uh, we've seen that take out a gig, uh, uh, gig internet lines just with one user doing it. So you really need to start doing some planning and draw a picture of who needs to get to what from where and when. Um, 
it's not really worth it to figure out why they're trying to do it, but if we can at least map out uh, those three things, we can sit there and say, okay, where do we actually need to apply resources or what do we need to scale up or scale out? Uh, we're seeing there's a little too much attention being paid to what's the size of my firewall, and realistically, there should be more attention being paid to how do I deal with these people who are hitting my stuff without ever coming through my firewall in the first place. Uh, with that, we need to very much uh, validate what machines will they be on. Uh, if people are distributing to home machines or uncontrolled systems, you need to do it differently and you're going to need to take some additional steps to make sure that you've got enough walls between you and their home environments uh, to protect your data and to protect your clients. Um, Multi-factor authentication, two-factor authentication, uh, you know, for, for years we've been saying uh, pretty much anytime there's a theft or someone calls and says I've been hacked or, or things like that, uh, multi-factor and uh, would have protected about 80% uh, of those. So eight out of 10 would have been stopped by multi-factor. As we throw everybody out to their homes and, and have them working in the wild, um, we really can't budge on the requirement for that. So if you have tokens, do you have enough? Um, is everyone actually trained to use them? Uh, we've already gotten the call saying our offices are closed because they're near a government building, but I left my token in my desk. What do I do? Um, you know, be ready for that because uh, as silly as it sounds, it happens and unfortunately it happens uh, pretty often. Um, and so what you want to look at there is, is there an alternate method you can give them? Can you flip them to OTP? Or if you have some people who are task-based workers, is there other ways that you can get them in without necessarily uh, beefing up the system that you uh, geared towards very specific use cases uh, as an example? Uh, this might be one of the times where you really have to diversify how people get in and treat the different user segments uh, as different types of users and maybe have a different solution for them. Okay. So a few tips. Um, have people patch before they leave the office. Uh, probably the leading cause that we have for people who are complaining and say, I'm not sure people are working from home. I don't see them on the VPN. And then we get the statement coming back, oh, my computer was patching, so I couldn't get in. Uh, we're, we're hearing a lot of that from folks uh, nowadays. Uh, and, and realistically, we would recommend make sure they patch before they leave the office and uh, that you test it. Uh, we've seen situations where it gets patched and now their Citrix doesn't work or it gets patched and now RDS has one of those new uh, encryption conflicts uh, or they patch and now their VPN client doesn't work. So you want to get those kinks worked out um, so that IT can actually pay attention to what's going on and not just do an endless uh, triage. So it's, it's worth the time investment of assisting people before they uh, get home. Definitely double checking your remote access client versions. Uh, if people don't get in often, sometimes their VPN clients don't self update. Uh, so we've uh, had to help people troubleshoot what basically comes down to old versions of clients maybe not being compatible with the newer versions of the VPN device. Uh, so that's another good one to try to predict where you're going to have issues by doing some software inventory scans. Yeah. IT should really be on alert for oddities. You know, now that everybody is distributed, things are going to be odd, but we've got to be suspicious. Uh, things like account takeovers and uh, phishing and spear phishing uh, and those ACH wire transfer, they uh, rely on the disruption. They rely on the uncertainty. Uh, and so, unfortunately, it means IT has to do double duty of getting people in and connected and paying a greater amount of attention to things that might be odd, because that's how you're going to catch uh, those people who are uh, coming in to either plant malware uh, or to just steal your, your data. And then the last one is um, if you need to increase your licenses, there's probably all kinds of ways you can do it. Our VPN has something called 
uh, spike licensing that lets me burst for a little bit, uh, but sometimes that's not actually a good idea because when you look at it, you have to do the prediction of how many weeks are you going to need a ballooned number of VPN users, and sometimes it's better to just increase your licensing, uh, or sometimes it's better to scale out your VPN capability uh, because of the licensing that comes with it. Uh, so that's definitely something that should be looked at from a couple of different angles. Uh, and you really need to make sure that you address it before uh, it becomes an issue. Even the best of vendors is having an, a, a number of problems with even processing orders. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you're ahead of that curve uh, wherever possible. So best bang for your buck. Um, this hasn't really changed uh, from last week. But our opinions here are cloud app security, because uh, you want to control for account takeover protection. You want zero day protection on your collaboration platforms and things like Salesforce. Uh, and it can all be done remotely, no endpoint touches, no trying to install new things on PCs, no user impact. Uh, those are the types of security things we like in this type of uh, you know, condition we're, we're under where people are uh, overly busy running around, uh, you know, it's not time to go install things in places. Uh, Open DNS security is really good as well, uh, has that follow me protection for on-prem and remote. Uh, it would require an agent push, but from our experience, if it's done right, no user impact. Uh, the pushes are easily done uh, when they're VPNed in or in some cases uh, even without them VPNing in. Uh, so bang for your buck wise, those two items are both proactive uh, uh, defense technologies. Um, they can be easily done. They can scale much uh, further than just 365 as an example. Um, and in OpenDNS's uh, case, it can sometimes protect you against 365. A lot of malware using uh, OneDrive and as everybody runs around whitelisting things like 365, uh, there's actually a lot of bad public shares in 365. OpenDNS is a good example and actually Cloud App Security is as well. Um, they can find those public shares and help prevent you from hitting a command and control uh, share as an example. And the last one here is implement an activity tracking solution. Uh, so when we're not talking with IT folks, we're talking with executives, they're all concerned about productivity. Uh, and as people are reacting to the pandemic and as people are you know, constantly tied to their phones trying to figure out what's happening next and all the children are home and uh, you know, bugging parents when they're trying to work from home, you know, what can you do about it? Uh, well, there are activity tracking solutions that work really well. Um, you know, we've got a couple we like uh, where, uh, you know, if you've done any of the searching on things like Gartner for activity tracking, uh, one of the issues is some of them do too much. Uh, and uh, as an example, uh, there, there are a couple that uh, our security systems will uh, feel is, you know, a key logger, a backdoor, uh, and all those bad words. So you, you do want to be careful about what you roll out. Uh, simpler is often better because you're just trying to ensure productivity. What you don't want to do is implement a system that does all of that kind of uh, rat and uh, um, uh, key logging and, and stuff like that because you're just potentially weakening your security environment uh, even more. So typically when we're doing an activity tracking solution, we end up turning off a lot of that stuff, uh, mostly because we want to be able to see about productivity, proactively do something about productivity, um, but not create a potential larger hole from a security point of view. All right, so that's what we wanted to go through for this week. So at this point, we'll open it up for questions, or if anybody wants to shout out or type something in the Q&A, we'll be happy to uh, answer if we can. So we'll stay open for a minute or two. So if anybody does have a question, uh, feel free to shout it out or give us a type.
Yeah, Michael, I think that's pretty normal for mine. I, I, I usually end up with quiet groups. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll try to jump up and down more like Bill does to, you know, juice it up, but got to admit, it's not quite my style. Yeah, this is Mike right here. Um, I enjoyed the presentation. It's some very good information here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, and as always, if anyone has other questions they want to follow up with uh, later or, or privately or on email uh, about how to do like the employee tracking um, or productivity tracking, whatever you want to call it, I like to call it idle time tracking, um, we can definitely help with that as well. Uh, so you know, feel free to email us or uh, I think Jamie sent you guys all out the invite, so feel free to reply to her and she'll facilitate getting you answers as well. Have you guys had any uh, uh, recommendations for using Microsoft Teams? Um, I know there's a bunch of security things that can and cannot be turned on, uh, you know, through the, the um, Outlook portal, or excuse me, the, the Microsoft portal. Um, but do you have any recommendations um, just in general? Uh, I mean, we have deployed a lot of our staff remotely, uh, mostly because we're trying to uh, well, we're a bunch of suspicious security guys, right? So we uh, chopped people into different groups so that one sick person uh, is segmented from uh, the other two groups. Uh, and, and in that process, we really started using Teams a lot more than we did in the past. Um, and uh, just from the last week of using it, I can tell you that our guys are loving it. Um, but that said, we already rolled out MFA. We already rolled out conditional access. Uh, so our teams is under the uh, control of both of those, which alleviates a lot of the security concerns. Um, we're not using it for phone calls, though. Why, what, for what reason are you not using it for phone calls? Just out of curiosity. Her name is Chris Himes. Um, we didn't want to start something new uh, that we hadn't done before. Uh, so we already have a cloud phone system, so we didn't want to suddenly change our phone system and uh, uh, distribute staff that are, are used to working in, in a close-knit team in the office. Um, so it's just too many changes in a row, and we already had a cloud phone system, so technically our guys can just have their phone sitting there um, and operate normally. Fair enough. So there's no security concerns about using the phone system through Teams. It's just you didn't want to change everything at the same time. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, we're loving the screen sharing. Uh, there's also some whiteboard functions. I don't know if you played with the whiteboard function that's part of Teams. Um, that's really slick for guys who are used to walking up to a whiteboard and doodling with mm -hmm. each other. Um, right. Works really, really well. Um, but I will say, if you've got Teams deployed, uh, please remember Teams is integrated with SharePoint, OneDrive, 365, everything. Um, if you don't have the multi-factor and conditional access, which means you either have uh, Enterprise Mobility Suite E3 or Azure AD Premium One, um, then I would say huge security risks. If you've got one of those two license packs and you turn that stuff on, uh, then I haven't seen um, a security risk um, outside of the user caused ones. Uh, so what I mean by user caused is uh, if your users start sharing your team's uh, file repositories out to random people on the internet and you haven't turned on the control that says they can't, um, that's a significant security risk. Uh, and we always recommend to people, you should not be allowing public sharing at all. And when you do allow it, it should be a very tightly controlled situation. Um, otherwise, you're allowing someone to have an encrypted tunnel basically directly into your quote unquote data center, even though your data center is in the cloud. And then all of your company devices have an encrypted tunnel to pull that data down straight to that endpoint. And if those endpoints are at home, they're missing a lot of security. Uh, right. It's one of the reasons we recommend cloud app security get rolled out quickly. Uh, it's because it fight situations exactly like that to be able to say, okay, I still have good security, even though people are sitting at home uh, and people are going to, you know, in, in the effort to get their job done, probably start sharing a lot more than they normally would. 
Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not quite at the E3 level yet, but um, I'm sure that that is rapidly approaching. So we're hoping we're, we're depending on policies and procedures at this point, unfortunately. And so if you don't have the Azure AD Premium uh, or the EMS E3, another thing to consider is uh, Microsoft auditing. Uh, it also will not create logs because you haven't paid for those services. Uh, so you might have some kind of log monitoring system that's looking at 365 um, that you believe will catch some of those. Uh, but what we found is if you aren't paying for those services, uh, a lot of the logs that the, the SIEM vendors need will not be produced. It'll be in your dashboard. You can see it if you stare at it live, uh, but it actually won't go uh, through the API to the SIEM vendors. Uh, and so that ends up um, you know, having a gap in visibility as much as you don't have the, the multi-factor or conditional access. Um, that would be where account takeover protection becomes important. Um, that's another aspect of cloud app security. I mention that because it is often cheaper than doing EMS. Uh, for most people, you know, our recommendation is you always have both. Um, but if you're having a situation where uh, you have neither, um, then uh, it is often, you know, at least with the security side, you'll know something bad is happening and you can manually go kill it, uh, which is not as good as multi-factor but at least you know about it and you can attempt to do something. Uh, and that type of solution is also, you're not changing people's work habits, right? Because you put in multi-factor and conditional access, people are gonna notice. And if they don't notice, you didn't install it fully, right? Um, so sometimes cloud app security can really help with uh, getting around that. Yeah, we, we're, we're considering the cloud app security um, I've been talking with Scott Grenai about it, um, you know, and it's definitely on the table as an option. Gotcha. Other questions, guys? All right, well, if anybody does have anything new, uh, feel free to reach out. We'll be happy to uh, take your calls and uh, talk through anything you guys would like. So we're, we're here to help. Um, if you need anything, just let us know. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining y'all. We're going to close on down. Thank you very much.